Welcome to Dementia Matters, a podcast presented by the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Our podcast is here to educate you on the latest research, caregiver strategies, and available resources for fighting back against Alzheimer's disease. I'm your host, Nathaniel Chin. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to Dementia Matters. Before I introduce our guest today, I want to answer a listener question. This person asked, What are some signs or symptoms of dementia my spouse and I should be watching for in our aging parents? This is a timely question with the holidays right around the corner because we are perhaps interacting with family members we might not see often and can recognize changes in memory or personality. First, a few changes that happen with normal aging. We learn at a slower rate. We require more repetition than we did before, but we still can learn. Processing speed is slower. We need more cues for recalling that fact or piece of information during a conversation. We may have mild word-finding issues or difficulty with people's names. Lastly, we experience increased difficulty with concentration. We can still do the things that matter, but it may take more focus than before. It's difficult to know what is normal aging and what is actually a disease, especially since these symptoms are present in both. A general rule is that in disease, a symptom is noticeable and bothersome to the individual. It starts to interfere with a behavior and how one gets through the day. Now, the Alzheimer's Association has 10 early signs and symptoms concerning for cognitive impairment, and you can find that list online. The ones that I think are most important are experiencing memory loss that disrupts your daily life or having new challenges in planning or solving problems. A very common one I see in clinic, difficulty completing familiar tasks, whether it's at home, at work, or doing things that you previously enjoyed like cooking. Other issues would include misplacing things and losing the ability to retrace your steps in finding them. And lastly, being more withdrawn from work or social activities. If you have concerns about your memory or thinking, please talk to your primary care provider. Your primary care provider will look at reversible causes, possibly get blood tests, and can even do a quick thinking test to see if you need more evaluation. And now back to the show. I'm here with Dr. Emily Rogalski. She is an associate professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. She has her PhD in neurosciences and serves as the, as the associate director of the Meshlam Cognitive Neurology and Alzheimer's Disease Center in Chicago. Her research focuses on communication disorders, in particular primary progressive aphasia, as well as super aging. Well, welcome, Dr. Rogalski. Thank you for having me here today. To begin, can you define for us super aging? Sure. So super aging is kind of a a quirky term and might sound a little bit um, funny when you first hear it. But the idea was we wanted to focus on not what was wrong with the brain in aging, but what was going right with the brain in aging. And when we think about aging, um, it's often associated with all of the bad things that happen. So from our hair being more likely to turn gray or fall out uh, to our skin getting wrinkled, And just like there are things that are happening to the exterior of our body, um, there are also things happening in the brain that are common with aging. So it's memory loss is one of the things that people complain about the most. And so the question was, could we identify people who seem to be on a different trajectory of aging when it came to memory? And so we define superagers as individuals who are over age 80 and have memory performance at least as good as individuals in their 50s and 60s. So we've got people who are over age 80 with memory performance at least as good as individuals who are 20 to 30 years their junior. So super aging isn't just a number. It's not that you're living to be 110. It's actually the quality of your your brain performance. You've got it. So we're not talking about longevity or just about longevity. We're talking about lifespan paired with health span. So I think we've gotten really good at as a medical community at helping to extend that lifespan, helping people live longer. But sometimes that's coming with the unintended consequence of um, our health spans not keeping up. So the goal is not to live long and not live well. People want to live long and live well. And if we can identify some of the secrets that the superagers might hold in that uh, space, we think that could be 
informative, not only for um, healthy aging, but also potentially informing our understanding of Alzheimer's disease. So one way to look at Alzheimer's disease is to study what's going wrong in the individuals who have Alzheimer's dementia and Alzheimer's disease, um, and then try to figure out how to correct what has gone wrong. But I think um, what we've learned from that is that Alzheimer's disease is immensely complex, and it's not as simple as one medication or there's one way, perhaps, that you get Alzheimer's disease. And when you have a really complex problem, sometimes it's useful to turn it on its head and say, well, let's look at the opposite end of the spectrum, and can we learn from these people who have um, avoided uh, memory loss and, in fact, have have extraordinary memory for their age. Well, it's a really positive term, and it's a nice way of looking at getting older in a, in a super healthy way. So can you tell me how common is super aging, and do you feel like it's occurring more often as our population changes? So I think that's an excellent question and one that I can't fully answer because the type of study that we're doing um, at Northwestern is not an epidemiologic study, which is kind of a big word to say. We're not looking across all people who are over age 80 and then figuring out how many people have extraordinary memory performance. Instead, we're trying to identify these people in a relatively local uh, cohort. So most of the people in our study come from the Chicagoland area or surrounding states, um, Wisconsin included. And um, so, but what we do find is that we set the bar so high for the super aging criteria is that it is rare. So we've um, screened over a thousand people and we've only found um, a little over 80 in the past 10 years who meet these criteria. And that might sound... Um, depressing at first, um, but we think that that's really important scientifically to really focus on these people who have kind of a rare memory performance, not to make everybody else super agers, but to identify factors that might really be making a difference. And if we've identified these unique factors, um, and some of them are modifiable, then they're more likely to be translatable if they're truly something that's contributing versus something that's maybe more common. Well, in your study on superagers, what factors have you found associated? Yeah, so maybe it's important to also think about, well, how are we studying these individuals? What kind of questions are we asking them? What are we, um, what kind of, uh, how are we putting them through the ringer? Um, and in that sense, I like to say that we're focused on, um, first and foremost, kind of four biologic cores, if you think about it like that. So we require superagers to have outstanding memory performance but are they also great in other areas of cognition? So do they have wonderful attention, um, other, um, their language abilities, um, something called executive functioning, so being able to plan, good judgment? Um, how is that compared to their peers? And then uh, when they came into our study, did they have a lucky memory day, or are they able to maintain this outstanding memory performance over time? Um, we're also interested in what their brain structure looks like. So we asked them to do um, MRI or PET scans, which give us 3D images of the brain. And there we can say, well, if they have memory performance like 50-year-olds, but they're chronologically 80 years old, what do their brains look like? More like their 80-year-old peers who they share um, similar birthdays with, the birth years with, or more like the 50-year-olds? Um, and when we look at that, we see that superagers are able to maintain um, their, that their brain structure looks more like the 50-year-olds than it does like the 80-year-olds. And um, when we look at that brain structure over time, we see that average 80-year-olds' brains are shrinking um, at a rate that's nearly two and a half times that of superagers. So what this does is it tells us superagers are potentially on a different trajectory of brain aging. Um, what are the magical factors that get us there? Uh, that's, those are some of the million-dollar questions that we have um, left to ask and answer. Well, how does your interest in superaging affect the work that you also do in Alzheimer's disease and other causes of dementia? I think it... So... The work that I do in superaging is really relevant to Alzheimer's disease and other uh, rare forms of dementia, and I think it's relevant for aging in general. So if we stop to think about aging and we talk about it, if you talk to your neighbors, um, we're, we're often focused on those negative consequences, what's going wrong with the brain, or that first time we can't remember where we laid our keys, and we say, oh, that's just a part of aging. And maybe we come to expect that or be okay with that too soon. So part of it, I think, is um, 
it's helpful to set our expectations a little bit higher. And I think the super agers are maybe an extreme example of um, what's possible in aging, but I think it's a good reminder that there are really people out there who are who are doing so well, and um, perhaps we can all expect a little bit more in aging. I also think scientifically, um, the super aging cohort has the opportunity to teach us a lot about um, Alzheimer's disease and um, its prevent, its potential prevention. Um, and even when we think about Alzheimer's disease, it's diagnosed by the presence of something called plaques and tangles in the brain. But these plaques and tangles are commonly seen in older adults above age 80, but just in less abundance. So one of the questions we asked was, well, are superagers immune to the development of these plaques and tangles? Or do they also have them and perhaps they're um, resistant to the effects of the plaques and tangles? And what we see is that sometimes superagers do have these plaques and tangles. So maybe that helps us to inform, well, which things are um, really a part of this uh, negative trajectory of aging, this pathologic trajectory of aging, um, or are there pathways to be resistant to that? Um, or do we need to redefine how we think about some of these diseases? How long has this study been going on? So we've been running the superaging study for about 10 years, but we have rolling admission. So some people enrolled 10 years ago, and then others enrolled last week. Wow. And so how do you see them every year, or how often do you have them come in and do the testing and do the imaging? We ask the superagers to come back um, every two years for what we call a big visit. And then in the interim years, they're either coming into the office for a smaller cognitive visit, or we're keeping in touch with them on the phone, if if for nothing else than to wish them a happy birthday. Well, it's very nice of them to be giving so much to the study. And I do wonder, if do they often talk about sort of other lifestyle things, such as what they're eating or what kind of physical activity they get, or even sleep, as that's becoming more of a common topic uh, in the neighborhood? Yes. it's So I think that there's been a, a wonderful um, amount of research that's been done about lifestyle factors, and we know that exercise import is important. We know that diet is important, um, and and as well as sleep. Um, I don't think our study is the definitive answer for um, what is the appropriate amount of sleep or how to figure out some of those factors. And we see a bit of um, disparity there in the superaging group. So we have some superagers who are still leading their exercise group at um, age 85, um, whether that's a weightlifting group, a stretching group, um, a yoga group, whatever. And then we have other superagers who have really exercise is not their thing. They never have done it, and um, they don't plan to start anytime soon. And that's where, you know, the genetics might play a role there, where some people are able to be okay without exercising as frequently, and other people it may have been very important to them. So I don't think there necessarily has to be one path for how people became a superager, but when these when this group does have things in common, it gives us a lead to follow up on um, to identify potentially modifiable factors. Diet is sort of in that same realm where we have some people who will talk about how they love their hamburgers and french fries, um, and even um, when we get to things like drinking, we'll ha ask superagers kind of what they think made them a superager, and some people are very lighthearted about that, and they'll say, well, it's because I have a martini every day at 5 o'clock, um, and others have never had any alcohol, so we get some disparity there. Um, and sleep is another one that we, we, so we track all of these things, but we haven't done a formal report on that. And part of it is we started out with a really small cohort of 12 superagers was kind of our first um, when we started reporting on this group. And now that we're getting to the size of 80 and beyond, we can start to ask and answer those questions a little bit more than we could have when you've got 12 people. Sure. So as the study is progressing, what are some key takeaways that you think would be important for our audience to know? Uh, and what are things that you have surprised you as you've gone through the study? Well, I think there's a, a few things to kind of take away. And one is that it's possible to have this positive uh, trajectory of aging and that um, the next time you sort of pass something off as, oh, it's just because I'm getting older, maybe stop and say, you know, maybe I can still do this just as well. And maybe I just had a, a, a quick slip of um, of whatever I was trying to do. And um, 
So I think our expectations with aging can be a little bit better and that we should celebrate the fact that there are so many people out there who are living long and living well and have a real opportunity to contribute um, to not only our scientific understanding, but to um, our community at large. The next thing is, I think that super agers, really their attitude, their curiosity, um, and the way in which they approach life is is something to be admired. Um, so not only are they being very altruistic in their um, participation in research, but they um, their curiosity and this this drive to um, find the best in life is something that is easy for us to take home no matter what age we are. Well, you know, I really appreciate what you're saying. And frankly, as a geriatrician who sees people who are anywhere 65 to 105, this idea of a senior moment, I try to to tell my patients, no, that really many things happen as we get older that get even better and that our quality of life continues to get better. It's, it's a mindset. Mm-hmm. And so I'm grateful for studies like yours that are starting to show that not only is the mindset important for, for mood, but it's also important for potentially being a super ager. Right. And I think to, you know, to drive home that point, um, we hear about social engagement being important and the negative consequences of loneliness and the positive consequences of social engagement. And so, you know, the next time you think about um, calling that friend of yours, it not only does it make you feel good, but it might have some benefit uh, to your brain. So you're, you're doing some neuroscience at the same time. Well, with that, I want to thank you again for being on our show, and we welcome you back the next time you're in Madison. I would love to come back anytime. Dementia Matters is brought to you by the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. The Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center combines academic, clinical, and research expertise from the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health and the Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center of the William S. Middleton Memorial Veterans Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin. It receives funding from private, university, state, and national sources, including a grant from the National Institutes of Health for Alzheimer's Disease Centers. This episode was produced by Rebecca Wazaleski and edited by Abishir Adin. Our musical jingle is Cases to Rest by Blue Dot Sessions. Check out our website at adrc.wisc.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. If you have any questions or comments, email us at dementiamatters at medicine.wisc.edu. Thanks for listening.